Welcome to Perspectives El Paso. I'm Leon Blevins of El Paso Community College Television. I went on air with this program in 2007. Very early in the life of this show, I uh, had a friend of mine named Bernie Sargent and his wife, Melissa, on this program with me. Along the way, I had other friends of ours, uh, um, Dean Underwood and Hamilton Underwood and Patricia Kidney and others with a group that I joined called Concordia Cemetery Association. And once a year, we were involved in Walk Through History, or reenactment of the shooting of John Wesley Harden. So I had Bernie Sargent and Melissa and some others on, and we talked about heritage tourism. You probably don't remember that, Bernie. So I have Bernie <laughs> back today because he's forgotten so much and we need to talk some more. Hey, let me shake your hand. Welcome back. Thank you, sir. And, My pleasure. And a, a new acquaintance today, Max Grossman. Now, we're not going to talk about heritage tourism in the full sense that we see it then. We're going to talk about downtown redevelopment. Also in 2007, at one point, I had a couple of guests on that talked about downtown redevelopment. One of those individuals was more for fixing up uh, to meet fire code and uh, fix up the facades of the buildings downtown. The other guest was more for clearance and redevelopment of entire blocks of downtown quite a difference in what has been happening. And Bernie Sargent, for a period of time, served as chairman of the El Paso County Historical Commission. And a good friend of his, Max Grossman, works with him. About a year ago, uh, Bernie contacted us and asked about being on this show because he and Max had started a new group. There'd been some controversy about downtown redevelopment. And I said, let's wait a year, let's wait a while, and then get you on and see how your new organization is going. So that's the reason I have it on today. Here we are in February of 2018. So we're glad that you're here, both of you. Thank you. Thanks. So tell me about uh, what was it that caused a split in the organization here with regard to downtown redevelopment? The split from the County Historic Commission? Yes. I think my personal feeling is it was politics. Max and I, Max was uh, vice chair and I was chair and we had taken a stance against the physical location of the arena as the city has now decided they want this facility to more metamorphose into. Mm -hmm. uh, we thought there were much better locations for it. Uh, it would lessen the congestion downtown, uh, the ability to grow it even bigger than what they originally had planned. It, uh, it, would be, uh, it wouldn't be two blocks from a baseball stadium, so we would have two major sporting event facilities within blocks of each other, and it wouldn't destroy some of our uh, historic fabric, and that's Duranguito, mm -hmm. the, uh, the site of the first rancho on the north side of the Rio Grande River. So the, the, a lot of little things that were coming about, we decided just didn't make sense, and we openly opposed it. Well, then there was a couple of uh, folks on the county commissioner's court who have uh, very close relations with folks on the city council, and one thing led to another, and when the reappointments came up in January a year ago, uh, it was decided that we would not be reappointed to the commission. I was there 17 years. Max was there, what, six, seven? Eight. Eight mm -hmm. years. And uh, it was, to me, it was really heartbreaking because we both had put a lot of hours into it, and uh, our whole goal, our whole motivation was the betterment and the promotion of the heritage and culture of El Paso, El Paso County. Well, to me, historical preservation, and I've had historical preservationists on this show before, one just recently about Socorro Preservation mm -hmm. in El Paso County. And it has to do with places, facilities. It has to do with weather and vandalism. It has to do with what is really historic and what is just old. Haven't you always run into this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, how, how do you define it? You know, we are blessed in El Paso of having very dry, very warm weather. If we were in any other location of Texas, a lot of these buildings these, that we're looking at today would be long gone. Oh, yeah. uh, but that's kind of a two-edged sword because people can own those buildings and do absolutely nothing. And if the city doesn't enforce code and force them to keep them up to code, they just sit there and just look horrible. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the problem we have with some of the residents of El Paso today, especially the younger ones. They don't understand what this history means to us, what it meant to us, and what it could mean to us going forward. Uh, and so they look at it and say, well, it's old, get rid of it. 
Thank God they don't say that about us because we're old. <laughs> hey, speak to yourself. Okay. Next, what kind of field do you do? What kind of work do you do? Uh, I'm a professor at UTEP. Uh, I'm a tenured professor. My specialty is architectural history. Oh, okay. And I teach Roman Empire, Middle Ages, and Renaissance, uh -huh. in particular Italy. But I've developed a second interest in uh, the architecture of El Paso, oh, the yeah. 17th century, right through World War II. So I helped my wife find, found the Texas Tro Society, which is a nonprofit. Bernie happens to be chair of the board. And uh, I got involved with the County Historical Commission and other groups. We have, we have an incredible architectural patrimony, maybe the best building stock in the entire Southwest. Oh, it's a yeah. gold mine. Oh, yeah. And uh, from, from when I arrived in 2009, I wanted to do, to do my part to promote it and educate the public and learn as much as I can myself about this unique treasure that we have. Now let's kind of put in perspective where all of this argument is taking place. Downtown, El Paso is right at the end of Texas, mm -hmm. but right up to New Mexico and old Mexico. And a, a lot of redevelopment has taken place right downtown. A ballpark, a new art museum, a new history museum. Now they're doing the children's museum and things like this. Clustering so much in one little area and in what you're looking at about where to put the arena, people in their minds in this show can think in terms of where downtown is, where the Civic Center is, a unique uh, facility there, the way it looks, shaped like a sombrero and so on, the theater. And then the, the big argument has arisen about just south of the Civic Center, about tearing down some of those buildings. Some are already being torn down and have been torn down. Damaged. Isn't that what your fight is partly about? Darren Guito, you call it? Yeah, it's a nickname that's been coined. Uh, it's, for lack of other terms, it's Union Plaza District. Mm -hmm. uh, but Darren Guito has been the uh, moniker that we've identified and placed on it. And there's, you know, constantly, you get 10 historians in a room, you're going to have 12 ideas of what happened in history. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's certain historians that claim that that name was fictitious and made up. Well, perhaps it was, but it does identify a physical group of buildings south of the convention center uh, that uh, sit on the birthplace of El Paso. And uh, nothing's been destroyed, but they have been damaged. Mm -hmm. Now we've had structural engineers go in and look at it, and they said that you know the buildings can be stabilized, restored, and used. And I think if we go forward and we try to promote this in the right way, we could look at things like uh, the birthplace of El Paso. As we mentioned, or I mentioned earlier, uh, with uh, Ponce de Leon's first ranch being located in the southeast corner of that property, I mean, it says a lot about El, Patho, El Paso's birthplace. And we really would like to expand on it. We've got a Henry Trost designed firehouse there. We've got the last standing vestige of the Chinese community there with a laundromat that took place in the early 1900s. So there's lots of history there. There's lots of buildings that could be stabilized and regenerated, could become the Middle Eastern uh, Culture Center, Hispanic Culture Center, the African American Culture Center, the Chinese American Culture Center, all in that uh, several block area, active 365 days a year not only maybe 80 or 90 days a year that an arena would be used for. So there's lots of things that could be done, much like other communities around the, uh, the country. Now south of there is Chihuahua, also yes. a very historic mm -hmm. area. Now where then would you recommend, or where have you recommended they build the arena if they don't build it there? Hmm. Well, we've got nothing but choices. Uh, at one point the city was considering four locations including the rail yards, which are just uh, east of Campbell, mm -hmm. where City Hall is right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but look, anybody who's flown in an airplane over El Paso can see how much space there is. Uh, we've got no shortage of places to, to build this thing if the city wants to indeed build it, even though a judge, of course, made it very clear that the venue may not accommodate sports of any kind. And so there are questions about its financial viability. Nevertheless, there are plenty of choices but just to put things in perspective, uh, the municipality of El Paso is gigantic, right? It stretches from Anthony <laughs> way to the Far East Side, but our downtown is tiny. Mm -hmm. Our downtown actually is something like 1% or less of the total surface area of the city of El Paso, and it's precious. It truly is. And if you go back to 1859 and you look at the original Anson Mills plat that established the street network of our downtown, Duranguito is about 20% of that. It's about one-fifth of our original historic core, and it happens to be the area, as Bernie just stated, 
where a man named Juan Maria Ponce de Leon in 1827 crossed the Rio Grande and established the first permanent settlement in the future city of El Paso. And that was a time when the river ran along what is now Paisano Drive, north of Segundo Barrio, right along the southern edge of Duranguito, and the ranch was established on the north bank in what was considered Native American territory. It was a dangerous enterprise to actually cross the river and establish an agricultural operation there, which stood for three years, was destroyed in the Great Flood of 1830, and buried. And uh, to this day, the archaeological remains are just below ground mm -hmm. and have yet to be discovered. Now, where is your big impediment? Is it the city council? Is it county commissioner's court? When will the final decision be made as to where they're actually going to build the arena? <laughs> Well, it remains to be seen. It's really in the, the court's hands as to, uh, first of all, will the sports be allowed? If not, then the city has to reevaluate. Because the sports portion of this program, the MPC, Multipurpose Center, okay. uh, is really going to be the driving force monetarily for the city. If there's no sports, then we, the taxpayers, will have to pay for the construction, maintenance, uh, all the costs involved with the, with the facility. Uh, so that's the reason why the, the city is driving it so hard. City leadership uh, elected as well as uh, city manager, they're pushing really hard to keep it there. They're committed. We have a handful of folks on the commissioner's court that follow suit with it. And then we have some folks in commissioner's court, one in particular, who is really, really supportive of what we're trying to accomplish here. The rank and file of El Pasoans are overwhelmingly with us. Mm -hmm. KVIA just hired a professional firm, pollsters, to uh, see what El Pasoans think, El Pasoans think about placing the arena in Duranguito, it has only 26 percent support among El Pasoans. And I should add that uh, we circulated a petition and gathered 4,600 signatures of El Pasoans who vote. That is, voting El Pasoans. Mm -hmm. And uh, that petition aims to establish a historic district, a local district in Duranguito. And between 70 and 80 percent of everybody we approached, El Paso voters, signed. So the bottom line is that our leaders are with the minority. They are going against the will of the citizenry. They are opposing our history and culture. And they are determined to demolish a very sizable chunk of our history and culture. OK, I want to give you a chance to put up a telephone number or website. Uh, about how many people do you think you have in your, in your organization? 44,000. 44,000. How can that be? Well, <laughs> <laughs> okay, then put your number up so maybe that will let us know. 43,788. But anyway, we have a, a Facebook page called the El Paso History Alliance. And we are not government. We are not a 501c3. Uh, we are a free speech zone where we promote our history and culture with photographs, maps, diagrams. We welcome posts from the public. It has become the largest social media platform for history and culture in West Texas, in the western half of Texas, mm -hmm. actually. We're very proud of it. And it's a wonderful virtual community for educating the public at large. We do talk about politics sometimes from time to time. We do get into areas um, that are controversial. But for the most part, it's about our history and culture. Okay. Just go to Facebook and look up El Paso History Alliance. It's that simple. El Paso History Alliance. Mm -hmm. That's it. And then they can puff that up to 60,000 people or something. We'd exactly. Yeah, you're all welcome. Come join us, please. <laughs> well, the, the, and the Facebook page actually has more uh, likes than even the Texas Historical Commission. So there's, you know, there's organizations around the state with more impetus, more uh, authority, but we have more outreach. Yeah. Do you have some pictures you can leave with us that we can show why people might be excited about saving Derek Garandito? Yeah, I do. And we have a lot of photographs. Uh, I've got over 900. Over 900. We're going to pick out just three or four and try <laughs> okay. to weave in. Yeah. Which ones would you want to say are most significant? Well, the thing is this. Uh, El Paso County, thanks to a project that originated in the County Historical Commission when mm -hmm. we were there, has just completed the most ambitious architectural survey in West Texas history. Uh, more than 1,700 buildings were surveyed by professionals who were hired to do so. And the surveys, the surveyors are recommending establishing a gigantic National Register District in our downtown that would include Segundo Barrio, Chihuahuita, and Duranguito. And the surveyors are telling us that there are 14 buildings in Duranguito that are worthy of um, either listing on the National Register of Historic Places or of being contributing buildings within a National Register District. That's, a, that's 14 
uh, critically important assets. And as Bernie stated, a trost designed firehouse, the last major vestige of our early Chinese community, uh, a Chinese laundry, mm -hmm. a community that once numbered over a thousand people a hundred years ago, um, the last surviving brothel uh, from that period, uh, 1901, uh, the so-called mansion. Do you remember who the madam was who ran that? That's Bernie's area. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bernie, they have set madam that ran it from year to year. Well, I know I'm walking through history. We have the mad people. Tilly Howard, and yeah, and Alice Adams, Abbott, and those people. No, we didn't have one of those okay. very famous madams. Now, you might, never mind. Okay. No, I don't know. I don't know. I was going to say, about. Bernie, you, you must have been old enough to just go there no, and no. find out, right? No. Well, yeah, uh, that close. That close. <laughs> yeah, if you go to walk through, and we should not remind everybody, walk, walk through history in October, go through and listen to some of these people mm -hmm. that portray some of the people of our past. It's the third Saturday in October. Yeah. Right. Who have you been portraying most recently? Mostly John Wesley Harden. John Wesley Harden. Mm -hmm. Which is a, a, a kind of a strange twist of fate. Uh, a few years ago, we were doing a show for the USO out at uh, Cattleman's. Drove home after performing that, playing John Wesley Harden. Got home in early morning. I walked out, got the newspaper, opened it up, and the building that his office was in had burnt down the night before. Yeah, so we were driving through downtown El Paso while they were putting the flames out oh. on, on my old office building. A loss of history. That was a tremendous loss. Oh. And the two adjacent buildings were then torn down on a pretext. The Gem Theater, 1885, and Henry C. Trost's Union Bank and Trust Building, 1914. Big empty lot. And some people were simply bought buildings just to have the buildings, but they didn't take care of them. And now some of those are being condemned and put up for auction. We're right. keeping our fingers crossed that uh, folks that really care will take those buildings over and do something positive with them. Mm -hmm. Right. That's why the county survey is so important, because it will make available tax credits for 968 downtown buildings that can pay for up to 45% of the hard and soft costs of renovation which is unprecedented. That's a lot of buildings. Mm -hmm. It's an incredible number. If you consider that there are only 24 buildings today on the National Register that are tax eligible, almost all of them have been restored or under restoration or about to be restored because of those credits. Mm -hmm. O.T. Bassett Tower, the Martin Building, et cetera. And that number will be increased by num another 968 buildings once this county survey is complete. Imagine the bonanza of historic preservation that will sweep across our city. Mm -hmm. It'll you know, be extraordinary. I gave a presentation Saturday to a group of ladies, and the question was asked, well, what is this going to do for the people that own those buildings? Because there's a certain amount of unknown, because it is unknown. Right. Uh, they just don't have the knowledge that they, they could apply for up to 45% in tax uh, rebates. But you also have a situation where those buildings will be identified, the history will be written about those buildings, so we'll have a very intense dialogue of history on over 900 buildings throughout that whole historic district. So going forward, somebody buys that property, they'll go, gee, I didn't know this took place here. And hopefully we can get the word out to the, the kids of all ages, all the way from kindergarten through community college and UTEP about the heritage and culture of our, our community. I went downtown several years ago when you and others put up a, um, a metal plaque mm -hmm. on the east side of the plaza. Mm -hmm about the Trost legacy here in El Paso. And you right. had some of the Trost family members come in Margaret, yes. for that particular event. But I don't see a lot of people stopping and reading a lot of those. But you do have some people, Leon Metz was very famous about it. Mm -hmm. uh, Freddie Morales and some others doing walkthroughs and telling the stories. Do you have anything to do with any of that of stimulating people to do more walkthrough histories downtown and describe uh, oh, yeah. these things. Yeah, I know there are pamphlets, the city has pamphlets and things like that out, self-walking tour. Well, the Texas Trost Society does have those kinds of walking tours that highlight the Trost buildings. We're expanding that a little bit because there were some other very notable uh, um, architects in our community, and then you have to tag along all the things that took place. If you talk about an Old West tour, so a walking tour, mm -hmm. we do those. So there's so many different themes that you could derive and you could uh, build on. And if you go to Chicago, there's nine major types of tours in Chicago, some of which are architectural tours, and they're sold out every tour. And busloads of people wanting to see the architecture. We could do the same thing here. Well, you know, like we had a, a group of folks come over from Tucson a few years ago by train, and it was not inexpensive. They came over here specifically to see the Trost and Trost buildings downtown. They were just so enamored with it because Trost has an impact on Tucson also.
Yeah. Well, we hear a lot about Trost, the architect, mm -hmm. but sometimes we don't hear much about the builders. But I know Password of the Historical Society mm -hmm. sometimes has articles about Morgan or McKee or others that were the builders. Ponsford, Ware, yeah. yes. Yeah, I mean, uh, there are some firms that were responsible for, for literally building hundreds of important structures mm -hmm. across our community. And the descendants of some of those people are still around, like like Mary Jo Melby, for yeah. example, right. who's, who's a Ponsford. Her father helped build uh, the Sun Bowl, yeah. for example. Yeah, and mm -hmm. Morgan Lilly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same yeah. thing. So there's there are lots of relatives, but that's another thematic tour that we could develop. Right. The bottom line is this, that... Uh, 2.1% of tourist dollars in the state of Texas um, are spent in El Paso. And we're the sixth largest city, and we have history to burn, and it's, it's an abysmally low figure. And if we could just change that, and everybody knows that the most important part of that formula is our architecture. Our architecture must be cared for, nurtured, preserved. Uh, if we're going to give people a reason to get off I-10 on the way to Austin, we need to show them something other than McDonald's or a gas station. Right. We need to develop these assets that we have. Well, sometimes we are the forgotten city of Texas. We're so far from the <laughs> golden triangle in the middle of Texas, running from Dallas to Houston to San Antonio, you know, that we're way out here. It is hard to get. <clears throat> I remember for years we couldn't get very many people out here for conventions because our convention center was too small. So we increased the size of the convention center and now it comes hotel rooms. And so we do have some people that are redoing hotels. So Paul right. Foster with the plaza and some others. Uh, uh, the Doubletree Hotel was built. And so it has brought more hotel rooms, which makes it easier to get more conventions here. Right. And then, of course, uh, our leaders enacted the highest hotel occupancy tax <laughs> in the United States, 17.5%, yeah. yeah. which doesn't help. No. No. They do bring in a, a bowling tournament annually in the convention center. That was hugely successful. Yeah, I don't know how long they can keep doing that, but yes, it, and I would be down there and I'd be talking to people and sometimes I'd be there as Uncle Sam or some other historical character, and they were taken aback. Good, yes, we didn't know this was in El Paso. Yeah, I mean, look, the bottom line is that people are not going to come here to see arenas and soccer stadiums. They're gonna come here to see what is unique, authentic, and interesting. Mm -hmm. And that is our history and culture. Adobe buildings going back to the 1800s, Victorians, uh, the Trost buildings, Otto Thorman, Mabel Welch. We have these incredible buildings that take us back to the Mexican Revolution, to the arrival of the railroads, to the Old West, uh, to the Chinese community, the African community, and our Buffalo soldiers. We go on and on and on. Um, but in the end, it's about the buildings. Mm -hmm. It's about the visual character of our community. What is the direction you want to take your organization? Outreach, it's very important, and it's with a positive acumen. I mean, we, we want to let the people know that we are opposed to certain things, but we have solutions. Okay. It's not like, don't do anything. You know, a lot of folks will say, tear it all down, or don't do anything. No, we appreciate and respect the idea that the voters wanted some kind of a multipurpose center, but let's find another location that makes more sense. Uh, let's develop that neighborhood. Uh, you know, let's not just tear it down because it's old and blighted. Why is it old and blighted? Because historically the city has not imposed ordinances or enforced ordinances mm -hmm. on the building owners. We need to revisit that and, and pay close attention to what we write as far as ordinances go. And you know, people like Max have just jumped on the bandwagon. It's really nice to have somebody from Minneapolis here. <laughs> <laughs> Avoiding the cold Cats weather. Cats out of the bag. Yeah, there you go. But, uh, you know, th there's folks from all over the country coming here to live and to, to grow, and they want their families to grow. And we need to uh, let the people know that we're, we're like a, a, a jigsaw puzzle of uh, cultures and religions, and we need to put it all together and promote it as such, as a unified uh, location where people can go to, not through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a huge challenge because, as you know, uh, local history is no longer taught in our school system, oh, yeah. and it has not been in years. And there is a huge disconnect between the younger generation and the better educated older, older generation in this respect. And our Facebook page, El Paso History Alliance, I mean, what we do is we try and compensate uh, for that lack in our educational system. We must educate young people and reach them and teach them to appreciate uh, what makes our, our city unique and beautiful. It sounds like you don't have a fixed fee for joining your alliance. No. Do you have a way of 
soliciting donations so they can be used for things that you're trying in your outreach? Well, as, as Max mentioned, we're not a 501c3 nonprofit. Donations would go right back into the development of the uh, Facebook page, maybe outreach with uh, articles that we could put into the classrooms and promote you know, the radio shows we do, the uh, videos we put together, the Facebook page, the YouTube, everything outreach oriented right. for a positive result for the, county of, or for the community of El Paso. Do you have a method for training people that are with your organization here locally to be involved, whether it's the walk through downtown or something else that is done? How do, you, how do you do that? What they need to do is go to the Facebook page, leave us a message, we'll reach back to them, and we will put together some kind of a plan that will get them in, involved in a more positive way to help us with a positive end result for the community of El Paso. Okay. Max, any last words? Well, I'll say this, that the Texas Trost Society, switching hats very yeah. quickly, the Texas Trost Society is a 501c3 mm -hmm. that organizes walking tours and that reaches out to schools and educates children. They're would be more opportunities for the public to get involved and participate and perhaps help out. Uh, we even train docents uh, to give these tours. So Texas Trost Society, there's a web page and there's a Facebook page. Maybe you could get some money and put up a billboard. There you go. See El Paso, see Trost buildings. There's an idea. Like that. <laughs> Wouldn't have to be a great big one, but something to stimulate to people think, what is a Trost building? Sure. And, and well, we could get something at the airport on their new digital screen. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Because, you know, the, like, like Max said, the Texas Trost Society is a 501c3. We do take donations. It's a wonderful organization that's growing with leaps and bounds. And it's something that's going to reach out throughout all of the Southwest, not just El Paso. Yeah. Good. I want to thank you for coming and sharing some of this with us because I didn't know what to expect. <laughs> <laughs> and your difference in structure from what you were with the Historical Commission, but we're glad that you're working on this and trying to save. El Paso. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thanks for watching another program we call Perspectives El Paso. I'm Leon Blevins.